So if we're taking a step back, we think about the traditional expectations and norms that we have around men and women. We expect women to be more communal and caring and kind, and we're expecting men to be more assertive, more agentic. And there can be penalties when people step outside of those assumed norms, those gendered norms. And so when women behave more assertively, that might be perceived to be less congruent with the stereotype compared to when a man behaves assertively. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of Wharton faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. Well, gender inequality in the workplace has been an issue for quite a long time now, but how much does it still occur and what can be done to try and eliminate it? We're pleasure to be joined by Marie Schweitzer, who's a professor of operations, information and decisions here at the Wharton School. Maurice, great to talk to you again. How are you? Thanks for having me back. How much of an issue do you think that gender inequality is in general in today's culture? You know, I think it's different across different industries and across, across different divisions, but it remains a persistent challenge. You know, you have done work in the past looking at the differences between how men and women are perceived in the workplace, and that goes to this uh, level of concern around gender inequality. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. So you can think about gender differences that reflect how people act and then how people are treated and then how people are evaluated based upon their behaviors. And there's there's evidence to suggest that basically women uh, incur some costs in all three of those categories. How much of a challenge is it, especially I would think right now, because we have seen an influx of women moving into C-suite roles. And that becomes, I think, you know, a, a greater challenge for what has kind of been an established culture to a degree in and around the workplace for, for many years. So, so we've definitely seen great progress. That's absolutely true. And even in the C-suite, still, however, women are more likely to be in roles like HR than to be the CEO or chief financial officer. So, so even though we've seen progress, there remain significant differences. What is the perception then of a woman in the workplace, especially when she's more assertive? Well, so if we're taking a step back, we think about the traditional expectations and norms that we have around around men and women. Uh, we expect women to be more communal and caring and kind. And we're expecting men to be more assertive, more agentic. And there can be penalties when people step outside of those assumed norms, those gendered norms. And so when women behave more assertively, that might be perceived to be less congruent with the stereotype uh, compared to when a man behaves assertively. And so there's some evidence to suggest that women experience more pushback for similar behavior. So when you have a scenario like that, then what is the impact back onto the employees, whether they be male or female, of having that component as a perception in the office? Yeah, so, so it could be it could present this challenge because. Women who want to move up the corporate ladder face a challenge because if they're assertive, they may be perceived to be overly assertive, but a man doesn't face that same penalty. What we've found, um, and what other scholars have found, is that when women advocate for a group, so for my team, for my division, for my area, when women advocate 
for others, this sort of we or us advocacy, it's now very consistent with that gender norm. So we're expecting sort of like think of that mama bear. We're expecting uh, an assertive women attorney, or if you think about, say, the U.S. government, we've had women secretaries of state for many years. Think about Madeleine Albright, for example, or Condoleezza, Condoleezza Rice. Like for many years, we've had women who have been secretary of state assertively advocating for others, for the country in this case. But how can a woman be assertive and still garner the respect that she probably deserves. Well, so there's a there's a buy, and I think this is one of the challenges women face. So, uh, so I think we've seen many changes. I mean, if we think about the last 60, 70 years, we've seen dramatic changes. Um, and even here, for example, at Wharton, our MBA class becoming, you know, really close to 50-50 split in terms of gender in our MBA classes. I think that reflects uh, an incredible progress, sort of incredible change from where we were before when classes were exclusively or predominantly men. We've seen the same thing happen in executive positions, though, though not to the 50-50 level. I mean, it's just, it's just things remain in some areas like computer science and finance, um, the, the gender inequality remains quite big. And I think in those cases in particular, women face a challenge in being assertive without being perceived to have violated some gendered expectation. So going back to something you said a moment ago, it seems like that component of advocating for others within your group, within your sector, is a very important component in terms of somewhat of a normalization of the perception of a female leader in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a company, in a sector? Well, yeah, what, what others have found is that basically when women are very assertive advocating for their group as opposed to for them individually, but advocating for the group when they frame it that way, that's perceived very positively. In fact, there are people are expecting that it's 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 congruent, and so there is a path, there is a lane for women to be very assertive and still consistent with that sort of stereotype in a way that does not cause them blowback for for being assertive. But then I would think the individual's mindset and kind of. Uh work style, lifestyle, probably ends up playing a factor in this as well, because no two individuals are probably the same in terms of reacting to all of these dynamics. Yeah. So there, there are definitely individual differences. There are industry differences. There are cultural differences. So as we go uh, across different cultures, you can see the, the gender equality norms, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, Northern European countries, um, we see much greater equality there than in some other other countries. And I think, you know, these things are changing not as fast as they ought to be. You know, as somebody with daughters, uh, I'm very keen to see these things change faster than they are. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is, realistically, are we looking at something that you think can shift over time or is some of that historical mindset and bias kind of ground into uh, what we deal with and probably will be there for a long time to come? Well, I, you know, it's, it's a socialization. I think uh, if we think about norms in our society, uh, you know, you and I are, are probably similar in age. Just sort of remember uh, historically how, how we perceived people who are homosexual, and now how normalized that's become. And part of that comes from changes at the top. When leaders advocate for this, when we see exa examples when, when laws change, we can see norms change in some, in some cases pretty quickly. So I'm optimistic 
that we can make real substantive change. I don't think this is uh, an innate, fixed, or fast perception. This is something that can change, and it's and it has been changing. But but gendered perceptions, gendered norms, have been slower to change uh, than we'd like. And, and I find it interesting because it's also a time where you will see uh, companies specifically probably more small to mid-sized firms that tend to end up being all female or primarily female. And so I'm wondering how a lot of these historical biases play in when you have a, a framework of a company like that. Well, it's interesting. Actually, we're seeing women in high school and college be very successful, often more successful than their male counterparts. And so new companies, emerging companies, there, there's now an incredible supply of very talented women, in some cases, far more talented women than, than men, again, depending on the geographic region, the, the area. But, but we're seeing, just as you said, some companies completely led by women, some new companies, some even sort of completely comprised to women. And, and I think that's going to be, uh, you know, something that will emerge going forward. I think that will help us, you know, normalize the idea that, you know, anything somebody from one group can do, another group can do. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking about, you know, gender is sort of a binary thing, but, but we're beginning to understand that it's really more of a continuum. And, yeah. and so I think, uh, I think the perceptions around gender are really... Um, going through a transition, and you know there are fits and starts, and uh, it's not all monotonic. But but we're moving to a very different place. Somewhat like what we're seeing with some of the generational shifts and mindsets that we've seen uh, in recent years as well. Correct. I think that that's exactly right. What's your expectation then for how women should perceive? kind of the state of the workforce right now and how to best handle a lot of these biases and scenarios when they come upon them? Well, yeah, so I think it's it's tricky. So, so on the one hand, I, I would encourage women to be very optimistic and very enthusiastic about the opportunities and the, and the way forward. On the other hand, there's no question that there remains gender bias and women as well as minorities from you know every persuasion are likely to encounter some bias at some point what do you do about that um and it's tricky because we could say well you want to fight everything everywhere but it's difficult to fight every battle and there's some times we've got to pick and choose what we're taking on because there's a cost as you sort of fight things and allocate your resources, the precious time and attention that you have to, to figure out where you can navigate your career the best. So you know, also, you... I'm, I'm optimistic these things will change over time as we see more women leaders succeed and demonstrate that anything that was a sort of a historically male position, women can do just the same. Where do you think that cost ends up showing itself for the most part? Does it show it in the career path that uh, a woman may have? Does it even to a degree show up in the productivity levels that companies may or may not have? Well, it certainly can. And uh, there's some work on uh, what are termed non-promotable tasks, uh, there are things like, you know, planning an office party um, that come up and some things that may fall on some people more than others, people who are around, who seem congenial, uh, who seem like they'd be a good fit for doing something. And there's some tasks that don't help people when it comes time for their annual reviews and the promotions that... You know, people can spend time and effort and energy doing. And I think fighting some battles in ways that may upset some people, alienate people, create friction, or cause people to wonder, hey, 
I know they had conflict. They're all two sides of a story. Who knows how much blame each side deserves? And so it could be that the battles that people take up can be costly. And and so I, th- I think we have to you know pick and choose where we where we fight and where we push forward advancing our careers and sort of blazing a path for change um, that, you know, that, that frankly has been slow. Yeah, because the dynamic of having those battles within the office is certainly a totally different scenario than having them out in the public when you're discussing topics and you, and you disagree with somebody. I think that's right. So how public these battles become, you know, that, if we think about influence with an organization, we're trying to gain allies. We're trying to advocate for our, our, our ideas and our positions. And so we need other people to like us. We need to be familiar and likable. And and sometimes that means not arguing over everything. Um, and so again, I think that there's a, There are tough choices that, you know, some people like, you know, women or other minorities might have to decide that uh, that representative costs that others may not face. But that being said, you seem very positive, very confident that we are on the right path so that we can have better work scenarios, better work uh, locations uh, where we don't have to deal with or consider these biases as much as we move forward as maybe we did in the past. I am. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future. There are clearly setbacks and, you know, in many organizations and many institutions, some of the most intense pressure gets put on young employees during their childbearing years when they are likely to be raising young kids, you know, pregnant, raising young kids. That makes things hard. I, you know, one, one cause for optimism is I see, you know, men and women, you know, it is at 50, 50, but we're seeing shifting expectations and norms and, you know, women, Women have been a major part of the workforce for decades, and they're assuming leadership positions, and we are seeing real change. Is it is it all going in one direction? No, there are definitely setbacks, but, but I'm optimistic that things are changing and that we will, we will, you know, in our lifetime, see things get better. You know, at, at the rate of change that we're seeing, it's not going to be solved. But, right. Um, but things are getting better. Maurice, thanks very much for your time today. All the best. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You got it. Maurice Schweitzer, who is a professor of operations, information, and decisions here at the Wharton School. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.